Well, don't be bashful when you do it. Clap it and let her go. It's all good. They don't mind hearing it, so you don't mind giving it. It's good. You know, trouble comes in all kinds of ways. It comes in all sorts of packages, big packages, little packages. There's a difference in the trouble you get from a flat tire. We got one of those last Monday morning. Don't you love starting off Monday morning on a Monday morning with a flat tire in the rain? That was Monday before. We're racing out the door, trying to get going. Karen's van has a flat. There's a big old something in the tire. Well, what are you going to do? The spare's flat. The tire's flat. It's the way to start the day. But you can handle that kind of trouble. You can even handle the kind of trouble that comes at you when you hear you're very sick, Mr. Jones, and we're going to have to start this kind of treatment in order to help you get better. You can handle that kind of trouble. But the toughest trouble, I think, to deal with is the kind of trouble that comes to you from people. When people accuse your work of being less than it should be, when they question your intentions or they question your motives, when they come at you with a vengeance and say, oh, you know what, it appears this is true, but what is actually true, and I happen to know, I don't know how they know, but they happen to know that in truth you are really after what is bad and not what is good. People trouble is the most painful trouble. It's the most difficult trouble in order to field. And today I want to take you back to 1 Thessalonians. And we've been looking at the picture of a model church. This, this is a church that modeled faith, they modeled love, they modeled hope. And Paul wrote to them and said, you're the one I put on the wall and say, that's the one I got right. That's the church that's doing things the way they ought to do it. And then he gets into chapter 2 and he says, the way I ministered to you, was by using model methods. I came to you in the right way. I said the right things. I treated you like a mom treats her children, like a dad treats his children. I loved you. I ministered to you with a sincere and genuine heart. I used the right techniques, the right methods. I wasn't trying to shake you down for money or get your attention. I wanted you to really be God's model church. When you get to the end of chapter 2, into the beginning of chapter 3, Paul is now going to give us a model response to trouble. And the kind of trouble he's going to deal with is the people kind of trouble. And so, pick up with me at verse 17. He writes these words. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence... And not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. But what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, Timothy our brother and minister of God and, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. That no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we were appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened. And you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. So here is the Apostle Paul, the man who had established this church. He got them going. He built up their faith. And for some reason, something happened and he was pulled away from them. 
And Paul is now writing to them to try to reassure them that the things being said about him in his ministry to them is not true. And so he gives us a couple of principles to help us deal with the people side of trouble. The painful side of trouble. And it is painful. Very painful. And it was especially painful to him. But here's the first principle that I want to share with you. And you will notice in your bulletin, I've given you last week's outline of uh, using model methods. And this week I've given you the outline to the model response to trouble. But two principles in particular that Paul is going to give us is overarching general principles to dealing with people issues. The first one is this. Keep your life focused. There's always going to be somebody that's talking smack in your ear. There's talking trash around you or to someone around you. And that talk is always distracting. It will always take your mind off the real issues. It diverts you. It annoys you. It will take you off a task. It will get you away from the things that God is wanting you to pay attention to. And you have to stop what you're doing. Turn your attention and deal with the trouble. Paul is having to do just that in verse 17. So keep your life focused. But how do you do that? Well, the first way you do that is managing the frustration. Manage your frustration with the trouble. Verse 17, But we brethren... Although we were wanting to keep our focus on spiritual things, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, are trying to get the attention back where it needs to be. The idea of this, this word is that something came in abruptly and pulled him away, very violently maybe, it pulled him away from giving his attention to them, giving his attention to their spiritual growth. The idea is, is like a parent being torn away from a child or a child being torn away from their parent. Notice, we were taken from you for a short time in presence but not in heart. And you know when you're separated from someone that you love, it's very difficult. You're separated in body, separated by geography, but you're not separated in heart. The heart, the love, is just as strong, although you can't be there. And he's saying, I want to be with you. I want to be talking with you. I want to be ministering to you. I want to be doing the things that matter with you. But somebody and something has ripped me away. Now what we think has happened is that there were those who came into this city and came into this church and began to say to them, well, Paul's not a good apostle. Well, Paul's really out for money. Well, Paul is just trying to hurt you. Well, Paul isn't this and Paul isn't that. And uh, we know the real truth about Paul. And the reason Paul is not here is he's over somewhere else shaking somebody else down for money. He's over here telling things to this other group of people to get stuff from them. Oh, I've got to tell you, you're better off without him. And Paul writes and says to them, that's not true. I want to be with you. I want to be right there with you. I want to be in your midst talking about Jesus. I care about your faith. That's my primary objective. Manage your frustrations though. He's frustrated. He wants to be with them. And then he goes on to say, I endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. But some people were saying, he doesn't care. He doesn't mean it. Don't, don't, don't worry about him. He doesn't have your best interest in mind. We do. And so Paul will tell us there are some things you can't help. And when dealing with people, there are some things you just cannot help. You can't help what they're going to say about you. You can't help what they're going to do. You can't help what they're going to stir up. You can't help the doubts they create in the minds of others over you. Paul couldn't help that part. All he could do was to try and reassure the church that he actually loved them, he actually cared, and he longed to be there. And what kept him there was not any lack of interest on his part or lack of desire. But it's amazing how people come in and do that. Hudson Taylor 
the founder of the China Inland Missions, was having a conversation with a young missionary who was sort of trying to get a grip on the start of his work in China. And in asking Hudson Taylor for advice, Hudson Taylor said, look at this. And he took his fist and he pounded the table. Well, the teacups on the table just begin to rattle, you know. The tea splashes out of the teacup. Well, the young missionary was rather startled by this display. Well, what's wrong? Is he angry or something? And Hudson Taylor said, when you begin your work, you will be buffeted in numerous ways. The trials will be like blows. Remember, these blows will bring out only what is in you. And what is coming out in Paul is his real love for the people that he ministered to. And what will come out when people accuse you of not loving your son, or not loving your daughter, or not loving your Sunday school class, or not loving the people that you're trying to minister to, when they say those things, it's like they're hitting you. They're smacking you. They're pounding you in the heart. They're knocking you around. What will come out of your teacup will be what's really in the teacup. Keep on loving those you love. Keep on giving to those you're giving to. It reveals the real heart. No matter what they say about your heart, it will reveal the real heart. So there's some things you just cannot help. Second thing in regard to your frustrations, realize that there's some things that you just must accept. Look at verse 18. Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again... But I'm still hindered. But Satan hindered us. Now the word hindered here is uh, something of a military term that means uh, an army goes in front of you and they tear up the roads so that you can't pass through. You have to stop, repair the road, or go around it, find another way to your objective. And he's saying, Satan has cut in on me. It was also used of like a, a, a someone getting in front of you. Have you ever had anybody just cut in front of you when you're walking somewhere, you're in the mall, or you're going into a restaurant, and they cut in front of you so sharply that you stumble. And those of you who have been runners, you've run track, cross country. You recall the days when, when somebody would get right in front of you and trip you up and fall. I remember a one mile run at a, at a high school competition in my sophomore year. And there was a runner who got right in front of me and I went down. Right, in, right into the gravel, right into the cinder track. And had rocks everywhere embedded in my knees. It didn't feel so good. They cut in on me. They hindered my race. Satan hinders you. He cuts in on you. He will cut in on your relationships. He will cut in on your marriage. He will cut in on your friendships. He will cut in in front of you and cause the relationship to stall. He will cause your intentions to have to be redirected. That's what he does. Sometimes Satan may hinder you. Sometimes God intervenes. But sometimes, people oppose you as well. In living our lives, we can count up all the times that somebody has cut in on us and stopped something good. Or they cut in on us and we just said, Oh, well, forget it! You're always cutting in on me. Run your own race. Leave me alone. And you get tired. You just get tired of dealing with it. Well, Paul is saying... I want to see you. I want to be with you. I care about you. And Paul is working hard to keep his life focused so that someone else who has no focus changes his focus so that he's off task and off track. You're called to love your parents. You're called to love your children. You're called to love your brethren. Don't let somebody cut in on you and take your focus off the things that really matter. Because this is where your true heart is shown. In 1895, Andrew Murray was in England suffering from a very severe back injury. And while he was trying to recuperate in this um, retreat place, the hostess came to him and said, oh, there's a woman downstairs that really wants to talk to you. And she's having a, a bit of trouble. And she wants to know if you have any great advice for her. And Andrew Murray, this man who has written all these books on prayer, a man who was a great communicator, a great pastor, 
He says, give her this advice. I'm writing it down for myself. It may be that she'll find it helpful. And this is what he had written down. And this is what he gave to his hostess to give to this woman. These words. In time of trouble, say, first, he, God, brought me here. It is by his will I'm in this straight place. In that, I will rest. Next, he will keep me here in his love and give me grace in this trial to behave as his child. Then say, He will make the trial a blessing, teaching me lessons He intends me to learn, and working in me the grace He means to bestow. And last, say, In His good time, He can bring me out again. How and when He knows, therefore say, I'm here. Number one, by God's appointment. Number two, in His keeping. Number three, under His training. And number four, for his time. And that helps me stay focused so that when things are coming in that divert my attention, I can stay focused. I, I learn in that process to manage my frustrations, but also to maintain my objectives. When you get frustrated, you get tired of dealing with people. And you just want to knock somebody down. Don't you? You, ever, you ever do that? You ever just... Well, metaphorically speaking, right? This is, if you never just wanted to just walk up to someone and say, i just like to smack the trouble out of you because I'm just tired of hearing it. You say, oh no, Pastor, I, I, usually I just bow in prayer before I say that. Well, do you lie about other things? Um, just posing that question. But Paul is going to try to manage his objectives and maintain those things so that he stays on task. Look at verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown or rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming for you, he says to the church, are our glory and our joy. So Paul begins by asking the right questions. When people are yelling in your ear, this, that, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, you're not this, you're not that. Complain, fuss, complain, fuss, yak, yak, yak. It's just the yakking sometimes. You just want the noise to go away, right? You just want pesty people to no longer be pesty. Well, he's got these pesty people and they're yelling in his ear. And he says, okay, okay, okay. What brings me joy? What brings me glory? What really matters? It's not you going yak, 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 yak in my ear, driving me bonkers. What is driving me is the goal. And you, my dear church, are the goal. So what is my hope, my crown, my joy? Your money? Because they're accusing Paul probably of saying, you're just shaking down people in every place you go. You're getting their money, getting their offerings, getting their time. You're duping innocent people. He's saying, what do I really get out of this? What do I get out of this? Those of you who've been teaching Sunday school classes for years, what do you get out of it? A lot of money? No. Do you get a whole lot of encouragement out of it? No. Do you get a lot of extra time from it? No. What do you get from all the ministries you've been involved in in this church? What do you get from that? What is the end prize for you? Well, what is your hope? What do you, what's the joy you want out of it? What's the crown of rejoicing in it? Is it not to see something happen in the lives of people? So you ask the real questions. When people are screaming in your ear and they're barking at you to the point you just don't want to teach anymore. You don't want to deal with people anymore. You don't want to go anymore. You don't want to serve anymore. You're tired of it. You just want to be left alone. You just want to say, fine, I'll stay home. You do it. Since I can't measure up to your expectation, you do it. Since I can't be the, the perfect wife, marry yourself, buddy. Or vice versa. You want to say to your kids sometimes, since I can't be the perfect parent, I'm sure you will be. So have a handful of perfection when you get there. Right? Sometimes you just get off track unless you maintain your focus. Unless you manage 
You manage those frustrations and you maintain your objective. I want something more for you than you know you need. And so I'm going to stay focused because I know the prize is worth it, whether you understand it in the moment or not. I do. And so he asserts the right answer to his objectives. You are our glory. Here's the right answer. Changed lives matter. Why do I preach? Well, because all preachers just love to hear themselves talk. That's one of the dumbest answers I've ever heard. Well, preachers just like to go on and on. That's the second dumbest thing I've ever heard. Well, preachers love to preach. That's the third dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I've heard a lot of dumb things. Well, what is it you preachers want to do? We want you to love the Lord. We want you to go deeper, to go richer. We want you to be a mile deep and an inch wide. I don't want you to be a mile wide and an inch deep. That's why I stay in the game. That's why I keep doing it. I'm going to tell you, as a pastor, it is not worth the trouble. If it weren't, for you. If it weren't that your lives matter, that your growth matters, it would not be worth the hassle. So, I think Paul is telling us, changed lives matter and changed lives reward. Let me take you to a very interesting verse of motivation. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, here's something that is always in the back of my mind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I know that I'm going to stand before the Lord, and I know I will give an account of my work. And I also know you will. And so as your pastor, I want you to stand before the Lord with a clean heart and a clear conscience. I want you to stand before the Lord and say, Hey, Lord, we're so excited to be here. Thank you, Lord, for sending us teachers and leaders and, and those who cared about our spiritual growth because we're here today. We love you, Lord, because of those who invested in us. Does it matter what's going on in that gymnasium right now among those children? Yes! What is Liz and Karen getting out of that? For all the time they're putting into it, what do they get? Well, they get to get out of they, they get they, they get to miss church. They get to sit out of the service. They get to get they get to eat cookies or something. You think that's what they're, they're down there for? No! I can tell you, those women want those kids to love Jesus. They want them established. They want them growing. They want them to sprout into trees. Oak trees who are solid in their faith. So Paul would say, you know what? There's a reason I do all of this. There's a reason for it. And I know that the trouble that maybe I'm going through may be seeming uh, an aggravation, but it is worth it. You know anything about bees? Do you know what bees undergo to be what they are? To be able to fly a mile here and there and to produce all that they produce? Bees are quite fascinating. But in order to develop their young, the queen bee lays an egg in a six-sided cell, very interesting indeed, which is then filled with enough pollen and honey to nourish that egg and feed it until it reaches a certain stage of its development and maturity. Then they seal the top of that little space with a capsule of wax. And when all the food is gone and it's time for that little creature to work its way up, it has a very difficult time getting to the top in order to get to its ultimate purpose. So, it begins to wrestle. And it begins to tussle. And it begins to moan and groan and try to get its way out of that little capsule. So it's out of the confinement. It can go on to its destiny and its life purpose. The narrow exit is so constricting that it forces tension and stress and friction on the wings of that little bee. 
Now, you might look at it and say, well, that's horrible. Let's, let's, let's tear all that apart so we can just jump out. If you do that, though, the coating on the wings doesn't come off. The bee can't fly. The other bees notice that it won't be able to fly. It won't be able to produce. And so they sting it to death. All the trouble that little bee goes through is preparatory to its ultimate destiny, to its ultimate purpose. And all that you and I go through in our ministry to one another is important to our ultimate purpose and to the destiny of those that we are called to minister to. So hold on, hold on, hold on. The second thing, verses 1 to 5 of chapter 3, Paul would encourage us to hold our spiritual vantage point. Now part of dealing with the people kind of trouble and to be a model of trouble is for those of us who've known the Lord, who are walking with the Lord, to hold on to our spiritual vantage point. What is a vantage point? Well, that's a place where you can look out over the territory and get the big picture and see what's really going on. You can see sort of the beginning and the end. You see the totality of what's happening. Paul is saying when you're in the ministry business, when you're in the people business, Business, you've got to keep your spiritual vantage point and deal with things in a spiritual way. So, number one, expect some pressure when you do that. Verse one, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left alone in Athens. So, he's feeling a bit of anxiety. This pressure brings some anxiety. If you deal with, with folks, you're going to have some anxiety. Being a parent sounded really good until you became a parent, didn't it? Remember, we just need a baby in our family. Remember those days? I can't wait for us to have a child. Remember those days? I don't regret it at all. But remember when it just, it just seemed you were thinking of little bows in their hair and, and cuddly little cuckoos, you know, that would be going mommy and daddy and all those wonderful little pictures you had in your mind. But the other pictures came later and brought the, the pressure side of being a parent. There's a pressure side to the people business. Expect pressure. Handle your anxiety and adopt a plan of action. So what Paul is doing is he wrestles with his desire to see them and put to rest all these false accusations. He said, well, I, I, I talked to the rest of the team and I said, you guys go back to Thessalonica. Leave me here in Athens. Go take care of them. Find out how they're doing. He really did care. So expect some pressure in the trouble side of things. Secondly, in verses 2 to 4, anticipate trouble. And he says, we sent Timothy, our brother, minister of God, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your money. Concerning your recognition of me as a wonderful apostle. No, no not exactly. Um, concerning your uh, building project. Concerning your carpet. Concerning uh, what color you painted your building. Uh, concerning the style of music you were singing. Uh, concerning what concerned Paul is what should concern us. What matters is our faith. Our growth in faith. What should matter with your class is are they growing in faith? What should matter to you most about your children, about your parents, about your friends, about your church is, will what I am saying and what I am doing encourage their faith? Will it help them grow? That's my ultimate objective. And Paul says, I wanted you to be encouraged concerning your faith. I wanted you to be fit for battle. So anticipate trouble. It's part of that spiritual vantage point. You kind of see in all the scenarios, all the things that are going to happen. And as you anticipate trouble, get fit for the battle. By strengthening yourself and strengthening those around you. He said, I wanted him to come in and establish you. To make you stronger in your faith. To strengthen your inner man and also to encourage you. I think we so underestimate the power of our ministry to one another. The power of strengthening and encouraging. It is your greatest calling. Your greatest calling. It really doesn't matter if uh, we paint the walls polka dot with big bright daisies on all the walls. If that will help you grow in your faith. Now don't go out of here and say, oh, the pastor's going to put daisies on the walls. I didn't say that. But I am saying it doesn't matter. What matters is faith. Amen. 
If you walk out of church and you have diminished someone's faith, you are not pleasing the Lord. And you are not growing the church. Paul said, the only thing that matters is that I help you get strong. And that I help you be encouraged. That matters. And I may not like your stupid tie. And I may not like your stupid shoes. I may not like your stupid outfit. I may not like the fact that you wear jeans or overalls. You don't wear a suit or you do wear a suit. I may not like or dislike any of that. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that you see your ministry as one of strengthening and encouraging. That's what Paul is trying to do, even though he's listening to a bunch of trash talk. So get fit for the battle. And then accept your destiny. Look at verse 3 and 4. He's saying, I want them to get you strong so that no one would be shaken by these afflictions. He used this word earlier in the chapter, in verse 6. Remember, you received the gospel in much affliction. In fact, he says, I don't want you to be shaken by afflictions for you yourselves know that we were appointed to this. Do you realize that part of our destiny as Christians is to go through trouble? And hell's trouble rattles our cage for sure. Um, trouble with our finances rattles our cage for sure. But people trouble will take you down faster than any trouble you encounter. People trouble. You may find out tomorrow you have cancer and you'll find a way to fight. You'll find encouragement through the prayers of others. You'll find a way to fight. And you'll get up tomorrow morning and say, I'm going to fight this thing. But what is likely to make you not get out of bed tomorrow is the people trouble. That's the trouble that will take you down. Accept your destiny. There's going to be trouble. So don't be unsettled. Understand your dilemma. Understand what's coming. I read the story of this woman who was trying to get her husband up for church one Sunday morning. And, and she kept going back to his room. Get up. Come on. We're going to be late. Get up. Come on. We're going to be late. You know, that story. You all ever have any trouble getting the kids up or the husband up or your wife up? You know, some Sunday mornings. And he'd say, I don't want to get up. I'm not going to church today. I'm done with church. I am not going today. I don't want to go. You need to get up and get ready. I'm not getting up and getting ready. This went on and on till it's obvious they're going to be very late. She's agitated. And he says, I'm just not going. She says, well, why aren't you going? I don't want to be around those people. I don't like those people. I don't like that church. I don't want to be around all that trouble. She says, you need to go. It'll be good for you. He says, give me two reasons why I should go to church today. She said, well, number one... You need it. And number two, you're the pastor. <laughs> Accept your destiny. You yourselves know we are appointed to this. And Paul is saying, you know, I've got all this trouble, but it's part of my destiny. It's part of your destiny. And so come on, let's move forward. And finally, verse 5, For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your budget. I sent to know your faith. Lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. You know what my greatest fear is as a pastor? It is not that we won't have enough money in the collection plate to pay lights, water, and salaries. I don't ever worry about that. Well, pastor, you ought to, you ought to show some concern. I take that to the Lord. I can't make you tithe. I can't make you give. But I'll tell you what I worry about. I worry about your faith. I worry about your faith. Are you growing? Are you getting deeper? Are you getting more grounded? That's what I worry about. I worry about Satan coming in and sweeping you away, of discouraging you and disappointing you. I worry about someone saying something to you at the prompting of Satan himself that makes you say, forget it. I don't need this anymore. That's what I worry about. I worry about your faith. That's what Paul worried about. That's what matters is your faith. Why do you go to church? For your faith. Why do you study? For your faith. Why should you listen to a sermon? For your faith. 
Why should you go to a Sunday school class? For your faith. Why should you pick up a hymn book? For your faith. Why should you do anything in this place? For your faith. So that you grow up in the Lord. And we, as God's people, have got to model. We've got to model our response to trouble. Because often what the communities hear is our trouble. And not our blessings. If you don't spend 99% of your time talking about the blessings of God so that you would strengthen and encourage someone, you are out of order. You are being disobedient to the Lord. Well, why can't I complain? Well, look what it was doing to Paul. Paul is being accused of not loving the people. Did he love them? Yes! How could they say he didn't love them? Well, somebody can say anything about anybody at any time for any reason. And they're saying it about Paul. And they're going to say it about the church. And we as God's people have got to hold our spiritual vantage point. We've got to hold on. Keep things in balance. Keep things in perspective. So that we become the model. Hey, you ever, have you ever flown a kite? I like flying kites. You know the wonderful thing about flying a kite is that you can't fly a kite without resistance. You can't fly a kite with no wind. And we're not, going to, we're not going to achieve our best growth without some resistance, without some wind. If you want your kite up in the air, you're going to be buffeted. You're going to be blown around. And that's what we're going to do in this community. It's not always going to be simple and easy. We need the wind. We'll take the resistance. We'll take the affliction. We'll take the trouble. And we'll move forward with it because that's what the Lord will use to help us grow. Would you join in prayer with me this morning?